By the end of October 1942, the city on the Volga still has not fallen. The Fuhrer announces to the German people, we have taken Stalingrad. A few pockets of resistance remain. We will take them one by one. It is just a question of time. For Hitler, Stalingrad has come to represent his victory over Russia. After two years of fighting in Russia, the Germans have threatened to vanquish the eastern giant. In the north, Leningrad is surrounded by the Germans. It has been a year since the Germans entered this northern city. In the center, Moscow, the target city remains just within reach for the Germans. In the south, the drive towards the Baku oil fields has come to a halt in the Caucasus Mountains. In Stalingrad, the Soviets are holding their ground. Contrary to Hitler's declarations, Soviet boats continue to cross the Volga, bringing over reinforcements. Every day, thousands of young Russian men, sometimes without any weapons or military training, are disembarked on the riverbanks. Those who back away from the German bullets are ruthlessly executed by the political commissars. On the 7th of November, the anniversary of the revolution, the beleaguered soldiers holding Stalingrad and the Soviet troops all along the front listen to their commander-in-chief, Stalin, make this astonishing declaration. Tomorrow, there will be celebrations in our streets. And indeed, General Zhukov, the man who saved Moscow, has a plan to keep those pockets of resistance fighting to the very end, in order to retain the German troops of General Paulus inside Stalingrad. On the other side of the Volga, Zhukov is secretly putting together an entire army. The country has been ravaged, one-fourth of its territory lost. But the entire Soviet Union is toiling away to provide this new army with huge amounts of equipment. Factories that were moved out and rebuilt behind the Ural Mountains are operating 24 hours a day. In this endeavor, lives will be sacrificed. It is the winter of 1942. The women working in these unheated, sometimes ruthless workshops are cold and hungry. Many will die of exhaustion. But the country's industrial production will increase tenfold. The United States is now providing massive amounts of aid to the Soviet Union. The Allies are able to reduce the threat posed by German submarines in the North Atlantic by forming protective convoys to Soviet ports, such as Murmansk. Anti-communism is put on hold. For the Americans, Joseph Stalin is now Uncle Joe. And for the British, good old Joe. The Russians receive huge shipments of jeeps, tanks, planes and trucks, and cans of corned beef. When they open the tins of meat, the Russian soldiers joke, we're opening the second front. Along with Stalin, Everyone expects the Allies to do more to alleviate their plight. In Egypt, however, the British are being threatened by the Germans. Rommel, whom Hitler has just promoted to Field Marshal after his victories in the desert, and his tank army, the Africa Corps, 
are getting dangerously close to the Suez Canal. They have reached El Alamein. The British Empire is in peril. The British Prime Minister Winston Churchill comes to encourage his army in the desert. The situation is grim, but he retains his sense of humour and shares cheerful moments with his men. And yet he is just recovering from his first heart attack. He meets with the newly appointed General Montgomery. Montgomery wasn't Churchill's first choice. And all of these soldiers in the desert are a little worried. The British, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the South Africans and the Free French. As soon as he arrived, Montgomery, the son of a clergyman, ordered a new programme of strict rules and discipline to be imposed. He is cautious. He waits until his army is superior in terms of both men and equipment. The new American Sherman tanks, for example, built for speed and power. Montgomery launches his offensive with a preliminary artillery barrage, followed by a massive tank assault. But the German 88 flat guns cause tremendous losses. Rommel's soldiers counterattack relentlessly. The battle turns into a bayonet charge, just like in the Battle of the Somme in 1916, with heavy casualties on both sides. In this deadly game, it is the side with the most men that wins. In a letter to his wife, Rommel writes, we're simply being crushed by the enemy's weight. He receives a message from Hitler. There can be no other thought than to stand fast, yield not a yard of ground. Rommel writes back to his wife. I rack my brains for a way out of this plight for my poor troops. We are facing perhaps the most difficult days that a man can undergo. And he adds, the dead are lucky. It's all over for them. Rommel retreats. In London, Churchill announces to his fellow citizens what is really the first good news of the war. Of course, the end is still our soldiers. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Churchill's words ring out around the world the old British lion has stood up to Hitler. Back in his headquarters, the wolf's lair, Hitler is scornful. He says, it is just a setback. The war will go on. And indeed it does the Allies open up a new front in North Africa, a first step towards controlling the Mediterranean. As in 1917, American troops sail across the Atlantic. The French writer Antoine de Saint-Exupery, who was exiled in New York, will return from the US with one of these military convoys. The author of The Little Prince writes, friends in America, I'd like to do you complete justice. 50,000 soldiers were going to war not for the United States, but for humanity, for human respect, for human freedom, and human greatness. Off the coast of Casablanca and Oran, the British and Americans are greeted with cannon fire from the Vichy French. They counter-attack. North Africa is still controlled by the Vichy regime, which collaborates with the Germans. The fighting is violent, and the Vichy forces suffer extensive damage. 
the Free France leader, General de Gaulle, makes a speech over the radio in London. Chef, soldat, marin, aviateur, fonctionnaire, colon français d'Afrique du Nord, levez-vous, aidez nos alliés, joignez-vous à eux sans réserve. After two days of fighting against the liberators, the guns are silenced. The Allies secure their landing. In Algiers, the pragmatic US Commander-in-Chief, General Eisenhower, negotiates with the Vichy regime's military commander, Admiral Dallon. Dallon is one of France's most die-hard collaborators who had even met Hitler. He decides to switch sides, and the French forces in Algeria and Morocco join the Allies. A few weeks later, Dallon will be assassinated by a French resistance fighter. Many of the French in North Africa greet the Americans warmly. The Zouaves in the French Army of Africa are also relieved. They never really wanted to shoot at the Americans. In fact, they will soon be fighting side by side with them, like almost all of the other French colonials. As will the indigenous soldiers, as they are called at the time, who will form the Moroccan and Algerian Tirailleurs units. The Axis powers have anticipated the Allies by moving into Tunisia, a territory still controlled by the Vichy regime which allows the Germans to stay. Rommel is retreating towards Tunisia. Two days later, in order to secure the Mediterranean coast, Hitler invades southern France, the hitherto unoccupied free zone. Hitler's orders are to take the port of Toulon, where most of the Vichy navy is based. With their shaky autonomy now at risk, the Vichy admirals decide to scuttle their fleet. They proceed to sink their own ships in order to keep them from falling into the hands of the Germans or the Allies. That is the tragic result of the politics of the Vichy regime. But it's not good news for Hitler. With the arrival of the Germans, those Jews hiding in the remaining pockets of French tolerance have little chance of survival. Amidst the increasingly sinister atmosphere of roundups and denunciations all over Europe, children are saved by courageous families. Like Karl de Brouwer's family. He is a Belgian banker. He films his four children, while he and his wife Denise hide two Jewish children. Monique Mogelski, the 12-year-old daughter of an engineer, who is hiding somewhere himself. And six-year-old Adrian Sepkaru. Adrian's mother was arrested and deported to a work camp in Eastern Europe. She will never return from Auschwitz. By now, many people suspect that when the occupiers use words like work camp, its true meaning is death. Carl and Denise de Brewer are everyday heroes who will one day be awarded the title of Righteous Among the Nations, along with more than 20,000 other men and women from all over occupied Europe. Three thousand kilometers away, outside of Stalingrad, the Germans have been enjoying a brief respite behind the lines before returning to fight the Russians in order to eliminate their remaining pockets of resistance. The German army's flanks are defended by units from the Reich's satellite countries, Romanians, Hungarians and Italians, who are totally unaware of the danger looming just around the corner. A 
A few kilometers away, the Soviet troops are preparing to attack. They are ready to fight, and there are over a million of them. They are going to storm the enemy's weakest units in order to surround the German army occupying Stalingrad. At 7 a.m., the Soviets obliterate the enemy's lines, pounding them with the rocket launchers they call Stalin's organs. Zhukov's massive army launches the offensive. The Hungarians don't have enough ammunition. The Romanians don't have any anti-tank weapons. They, as well as the Italians, lost a massive number of men. The two Soviet armies from the north and the south meet up. Soviet filmmakers use their skills to glorify the moment. The Germans see the Soviet tanks close the circle around them. General Paulus's 6th Army is trapped inside Stalingrad. Hitler is in the Berghof, his retreat in Berchtesgaden in the Bavarian Alps, where he is informed of the Soviet offensive. His immediate reaction is to hide this news from the German people. He rushes off to his headquarters in East Prussia, declaring, if the 6th Army withdraws from Stalingrad, the Wehrmacht will never be able to return. Paulus could still break out of the encirclement, but he would have to obey orders. For when Hitler arrives at the wolf's lair, he sends him this message. Stand firm. An army will come to rescue you. But no army is able to reach them, and the aeroplanes of the Luftwaffe fail to deliver sufficient supplies, in spite of the promises made by the head of the Air Force, Hermann Goering. At Christmas, rations are reduced to 50 grams of bread and 12 grams of fat. Mussolini, who has just lost an army in Stalingrad, is looking for a way to shift German attention back to North Africa. He writes to Hitler, In my opinion, Russia can never be annihilated. She is defended by her very size, a territory so vast that it can never be conquered or held. The Russian chapter is over. We should make peace with Stalin. What would Hitler do? To negotiate would be to admit that the campaign in Russia was a huge failure. Future events, however, will not give Hitler the choice. Roosevelt, the President of the United States, has arrived in Casablanca in Morocco to attend one of the most important meetings in modern history. He and Churchill want to settle the prickly question of French political power. Roosevelt wants to exclude de Gaulle, who since 1940 has been claiming his legitimacy as the leader of the French resistance movement. Roosevelt says, General de Gaulle is a soldier, certainly a patriot and devoted to his country. But on the other hand, he is also a politician and a sectarian, and I believe in him he has all the attributes of a dictator. Roosevelt prefers to invite another of France's great leaders to Casablanca, General Giraud. 
taken prisoner in 1940, he has just escaped from Germany and arrived in North Africa. He cuts a dashing figure. Churchill continues to support de Gaulle, whom he invites in order to try to reconcile the two rival generals, which is not an easy task. Roosevelt and Churchill agree that future cooperation between the two adversaries is necessary in order to save France. It is obvious that Roosevelt has warmer feelings for Giraud than for de Gaulle. Then at the closing press conference, Roosevelt and Churchill make a declaration of the utmost importance. With great vehemence, they pronounce the words that will henceforth become the Allies' credo unconditional surrender by Germany, Japan and Italy. There will be no more negotiating. The Allies will keep fighting the Axis powers until the very end. The price in lives will be high and many believe that this radical position, whose purpose is to reassure the Soviets, will only serve to increase the Germans' devotion to their Führer. Stalin is satisfied. He feared that Hitler would conclude a separate peace with the Allies in order to pit all of his forces against Russia. He launches his offensive to annihilate the beast still lurking in the ruins of Stalingrad. Beyond the red flag is the Univermag store, where the commander of the 6th Army, General Friedrich Paulus, is entrenched. His men surrender. The day before, Hitler had promoted him to Field Marshal, thinking it would compel him to commit suicide in order to save his honor. Paulus, however, on the verge of collapse, weakened by dysentery and revolted by the absurdity of Hitler's orders, allows himself to be captured. Field Marshal Paulus is an extraordinary prize for the Soviets. He is the man that masterminded Operation Barbarossa, the plan to invade the Soviet Union. The Soviet leaders can hardly believe it. Paulus will collaborate with the Soviets and testify at the Nuremberg trials against his former commanders, such as Keitel. When he is released in 1953, he will settle in East Germany. His reaction is mainly a rejection of Hitler's outrageous policies. Many of his men feel the same way. Hitler can go to the devil, the German prisoners dare to mutter in the few words of Russian they know. We want to go home. We can only imagine how the people in the occupied countries must have felt. After the German defeat at Stalingrad, hope is revived. The German news broadcasts do not, of course, show any of these images. And Hitler says, we must not use the word surrender. We must explain that our men were unable to receive supplies and that is why they were beaten. We have to use the word sacrifice. The Nazis want to turn this national disaster into an opportunity for galvanizing the German people. The Minister of Propaganda, Goebbels, assumes the task of mobilizing all the nation's energy and resources towards this end.
in the audience seemingly ecstatic is Albert Speer. He will furnish Hitler with the means to implement total war. Hitler calls him his only friend. The 38-year-old architect, builder of the Führer's megalomaniac edifices, has been appointed Minister of Armaments. Speer gives new impetus to the German war industry. He is a masterful organizer, but above all, he is an adamant Nazi. Under his orders, millions of foreign or Jewish civilians will be rounded up and worked to exhaustion or to death. After Russia and Poland, occupied France is the country that provides the Nazis with the greatest number of workers. The Vichy regime institutes a compulsory labor service and drafts 600,000 French workers for Germany. Those who want to evade this service take to the forests and join the resistance movement. The song of these groups is the partisan song. Underground resistance groups have been created in all of the occupied countries. Behind the walls of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Germans are confronted by a Jewish uprising. Before the war, the Warsaw Ghetto was a lively open district, filmed in colour here by an American tourist. In 1940, the Nazis turned this pleasant area of Warsaw into an overpopulated prison. This woman shrieks in grief as she carries her dead child through the streets. The Warsaw Ghetto in 1941. ghetto in 1942. The ghetto in 1943. The Nazis deliberately starved the people in order to kill, weaken and prevent any kind of revolt. But the Jews managed to acquire weapons and they die fighting. The survivors are deported to the Dublinka extermination camp and executed. The ghetto is razed to the ground. At the same time, the Allies win another victory. They enter Tunis.
Behind these gates, the Germans had already initiated policies to persecute the Jews in Tunisia during their short occupation. The Jews immediately take the opportunity to remove their yellow stars. The Italian prisoners receive insulting gestures from the crowd. Rommel, who is still in Tunisia, is filmed by a German officer before boarding one of the last planes leaving for Germany. In March 1943, he wrote, I have received instructions to take sick leave and get myself back into shape. All my efforts to save my men and get them back to the continent have been fruitless. Orders have been issued by the Führer's headquarters to maintain the utmost secrecy concerning my recall to Germany. My military reputation is still to serve as a deterrent. The Africa Corps has been captured and is now marching in long lines towards the American fleet's ships to be taken away to the other side of the Atlantic. During the war, 380,000 Germans will be sent over to Canada and the United States from where escape is impossible. These prisoners are about to embark on a strange odyssey. It begins on these military transport ships. Many feel like they're in a dream. For them, the war is over and they are safe. However, for these German soldiers, the dream will soon turn into a nightmare because even here, the Nazis remain in control. These men coming off the boat in Canada insist on making the salute, even those with just one arm. Some prisoners are sent to camps in Virginia and Texas. They work on cotton or tobacco plantations. In these barracks, Nazi law continues to terrorize the prisoners. Within a short time, Nazi officers have taken control of the prisons using intimidation, torture, and even murder to maintain fascist ideology among their fellow prisoners. And this message must reach the German soldiers fighting and suffering on all of the German fronts. They have to understand that they have nothing to gain from turning themselves in to the Allies. On the Eastern Front, ever since the fall of Stalingrad, the Wehrmacht is never the same. The soldiers exchange rumors about the Führer. Apparently he's lost his head. He's being secretly held in Berchtesgaden. It's his double that we're seeing. But no, it is Hitler himself, filmed here in Berchtesgaden by his mistress, Eva Braun. Since his army's defeat at Stalingrad and El Alamein, he's changed. His famous moustache has greyed. One of his generals, von Singer, is struck by his appearance. He says, his skin was flaccid. The look in his blue eyes, which had mesmerized the crowds, was reddened by insomnia. In fact, his physician, Dr. Morell, has concocted cocaine eye drops for him. Morell is filmed here on the 20th of April, 1943, with the secretaries and close friends who have come to wish the Führer a happy birthday. He is only 54. Morell is able to make him presentable for ceremonies. Hitler, however, is careful to keep his left arm under control. It tends to tremble. He is already showing signs of Parkinson's disease.
As a result, the head of the SS, Himmler, becomes even more important. The SS, whose recruits were now coming from the Hitler Youth, started out as the Schutzstaffel, the protection squad for Nazi officials. Later, it would provide the guards for the concentration camps. The SS has now created a veritable army of its own, the Waffen-SS. In the future, these elite troops, under Himmler's orders, are expected to replace the Wehrmacht, which is no longer considered completely loyal. Increasingly, Himmler recruits from the occupied countries, fanatics such as these Bosnian SS. In the occupied areas of Russia, the SS also has no problem recruiting two divisions of Cossacks, who during the time of the Tsars were already known for their bloody anti-Semitic pogroms. They will form the fearsome 15th SS Cavalry Corps. As for the Wehrmacht, it will enlist as many as one million Soviet prisoners who have no other choice. They can either die of hunger or fight alongside the Germans. Some, like former Soviet General Andrei Vlazov, are also against Stalin. After the German siege of Leningrad, Vlazov was taken prisoner and changed sides. He will command the Russian Liberation Army under the flag of the Wehrmacht. The Germans outfit this veritable foreign legion of theirs with the best equipment, such as the Tiger tank, designed by the brilliant engineer Ferdinand Porsche. With its 88mm gun, the Tiger was the most dreaded of the German tanks. As a result, back in the wolf's lair, Hitler starts to feel hopeful again. He can now renew his obsession with destroying the Red Army. He wants to attack at Kursk. The Russians have pushed forward into the front lines and Germany will launch a massive summer offensive, Operation Citadel, the biggest tank battle in history. 2,700 German tanks are preparing to combat 3,600 Soviet tanks. But the technical superiority of the German Tiger appears to be overwhelming. Hitler knows the importance of this battle. To lead his force of 900,000 soldiers, he has chosen the man who helped him to win the Battle of France, Field Marshal von Manstein. The offensive, led by the Tiger tanks, breaks through the Soviet lines, but encounters a brutal anti-armor defense set up by the Soviets and dense concentrations of tanks. The Wehrmacht's troops are pushed back. Even the formidable Tiger tanks are falling victim to the Soviets. And the Soviets have a secret weapon. The British have succeeded in capturing and decoding the German encryption machine called Enigma, and they are now able to read all of the most secret German orders. The powerful Soviet secret service in Great Britain had managed to pass on the decoded operation plans to Moscow. This war is also an espionage war.
At Kursk, the outcome is devastating for the Germans, who have already lost 50,000 men in this battle. Von Manstein wants reinforcements in order to continue his offensive. He is waiting for Hitler. He immediately tells him, we have suffered losses, but the Russians have too, even worse. Hitler seems very hesitant. He mutters a few inanities. Von Manstein will write, he seems to me to be quite feeble. This impression is confirmed when von Manstein shows Hitler the figures of the losses incurred at Kursk. Since the beginning of the war, two million German soldiers have already been killed, wounded or gone missing in action. Hitler will never be able to fill that void. Things are now a far cry from the victories of the Lightning War campaigns, the Blitzkrieg of the Battle of France. Kursk is the real turning point in the war because Hitler moves over to the offensive. Overcome by paranoia, he insists on having stenographers present. Von Manstein does not believe that everything is lost, but Hitler disagrees. Von Manstein implores him to continue the offensive. Hitler refuses. The Battle of Kursk is over. For Hitler, the priority now is to send reinforcements over to Sicily, where the Allies have just landed. The noose is tightening. Things are moving fast. All Hitler can do is try to hold back the advancing Allies. But he is unable to prevent the fall of Mussolini, which leads Italy to surrender and to change sides. The new Italian government has Mussolini imprisoned up in the mountains. Hitler sends an airborne commando unit to rescue him. Hitler wants Mussolini back in power. He sends him back to Italy to re-establish his fascist regime with the help of the German army. The Germans invade Italy and have no qualms about slaughtering their former allies who attempt to resist. The Germans immediately start going after the Jews in Rome, Milan, Genoa, Florence, and Trieste. Hitler's greatest concern is to prevent any further Allied landings in Italy and above all in France. This is the idea behind Fortress Europe whose emblem is the Atlantic Wall, a staggering system of fortifications stretching from Norway down to the Spanish border. Rommel is put in charge of defending Fortress Europe. He says it is absolutely necessary that we push the British and Americans back from the beaches. Afterwards, it will be too late. The first 24 hours of the invasion will be decisive. It will be the longest day. For Rommel and the Nazis, this is the beginning of the twilight of the gods, the final months of Nazi Germany. And yet these German newsreel images of Rommel, who has been invited to tea by Magda Goebbels, the wife of the propaganda minister, are revealing of the mood of the Nazis at this point in the war. Nazi ideology puts faith in victory and vanquishes doubt. Magda Goebbels worships Hitler like a god, even though he is driving Germany into a frenzy of bloodshed and death. Magda Goebbels has given all of her six children first names that begin with the letter H, just like Hitler. Helga, Hildegard, Holdine, Helmut, Hedwig, and Heidrun. She will kill them all, one by one, on the last day of the Reich.